Hello. <laughs> so before, before that, um, I made a slide about me, because um, I figure you might want to know who I am. I'm the VP of Community for Ink Tank, and Ink Tank is the principal sponsor of the Ceph project, and being VP of Community basically means that my job is to make sure that as we build a company around this amazing technology and its community that we don't screw it up. So that's kind of my job. And this is how you can reach me. I'll have one at the end again. Um, <clears throat> so we're talking about the cloud today. When you look at most cloud stacks, uh, wow, it's loud planes. When you look at most cloud stacks, you're looking at really compute, network, and storage are the three main pieces of, of cloud stacks. And Ceph is a storage technology. So that's where we live. And um, we call it the future of storage just because we think it is. Um, but here's the past of storage, right? Initially, data storage used to be kind of that. It used to be something between a human being and a rock, or maybe like a chisel or something. I mean, when information was first being generated and stored, and then eventually we kind of moved on to humans and ink and paper, and so now you have, you have three things here. I guess you had a chisel when you were putting stuff on rocks before, but you could be using mud or whatever. But so then something happened where now you have a human and a computer in some sort of digital media, right? And this is the history of storage on one slide. <clears throat> so you notice that we have this human computer tape paradigm going on now, which really can be expressed as you and technology sitting between you and your data, right? So this is what Ceph is, is this part of this technology stack that sits between you and your data. So everybody's seen a graph like this. This is what's happening to our data, right? We're not getting less data as a society or as a species. We're getting more data, scary more data, lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of data. And so people generally, when they wanted to scale out data storage in the old days, they'd do something like this. You'd attach a bunch of disks to a computer, right? And then multiple people can, can access multiple disks through a single computer and that sort of thing. And it usually ends up looking a little more like this because things scale as we say, right? <clears throat> so people started figuring out how to scale things up. And what that means is they take that computer and they replace it with a real big expensive computer that costs a lot of money. And this is called scaling up. And it's broken for obvious reasons. And so people have figured out now how to scale out. What scaling out means is instead of taking what you have today and making it bigger, you're taking what you have today and making it broader, right? You're taking having more of it and you're parallelizing work, which is a whole new approach. So as people began to figure this out, they started to build appliances that do this, right? So all these computers and all these disks in this scale-out storage architecture are kind of put all in a, in a box, you know? So you have lots of computers and lots of disks in one box, and this is what we call storage appliances, right? And uh, these are actual things you... You, you buy them from people and you write checks for them and they're hardware and you put them on a forklift and you get them delivered to your data center and you bolt it into a rack and you plug a cable into it, right? It's, it's a thing. It's an actual thing. And here's what's inside that thing. If you get a storage appliance, you're looking at proprietary hardware, right? This is hardware. It's not, uh, it's not like a Dell or a, 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 an HP box. It's proprietary hardware. And on top of that, there's a proprietary software layer, a layer of software on top that's proprietary. And on top of that, generally, there's support and maintenance. And this is a storage appliance. And just for a bit of trivia, uh, one of the largest storage companies is EMC. And I looked at their 10K, and they spend about $5.2 billion, or they earned about $5.2 billion on support and maintenance. That's about 34% of their 2012 revenue. Uh, they put about $1.1 billion in R&D into their proprietary software. And um, they have 1.6 million square feet of manufacturing space to build this proprietary hardware. This is really big business, right? So what started to happen since this model was, was really its most successful, I think, is that the cloud has started raining bits down on our head, right? Everybody, we're here today because there's an inflection point and something has to change. So this is the approach that we favor. <clears throat> we favor standard hardware, everyday hardware that you already know, that you're already using. On top of that, open source software that's free, and then on top of that, enterprise subscriptions, if you need them, they're optional. Actually, there's, there's a tag that says optional up in there in the, uh, in the uh, optional, optional. So we think this is a much more sustainable model for storage, right? And that's what Ceph is. That's how Ceph got built. It's because we, we saw a need for this exact thing. So looking at Ceph, um, there are a couple of design considerations that were made. I'll start with the philosophical design consider considerations, then go on to the more technical ones. First, we wanted it to be open source, right? We wanted it to be open source because uh, we think that it's the best way to spread new technology. It's the best way to get technology into the hands of people who can use it uh, most quickly. It was also designed to be community focused. So a lot of people make open source technology that's not community focused. And that's kind of the, one of the big things about open source is people will, 
will say open source and they'll infer community focused and they don't really mean community focused, they just mean open source. Community focused means that anybody can decide uh, what, what new features Ceph should have. Anybody can fix a bug, anybody can update the documentation. And as a result, because all of us are a whole lot smarter than uh, some of us, uh, then we end up with a better product. That's what we wanted for Ceph. We also wanted it to be scalable. As I said, not just um, a bigger version of something, uh, but more of something, right? If you, if you have a convention in town and you need to have 20,000 people in a hotel, you won't just try to find a big hotel, you'll try to find a lot of hotels, right? <laughs> I mean, to, to deal with that. So you need to be scalable. And part of being scalable is having no single point of failure, none. Not, not part of it has no single point of failure, and then there's some controller node on top that is a single point of failure, but there really is no single point of failure. And the third piece is, we want it to be software-based. We're not a hardware company. Ceph is not about building, soft, uh, building hardware, it's about building software. And then finally, we wanted it to be self-managing, because if you have something that is this big, you can't be you know, jumping up and down every time a hard drive fails. It needs to deal with outages and uh, deal with things in, in an appropriate way. So we took all these design considerations, and um, eight years and 20,000 commits later, uh, we ended up with Ceph. And that's actually a graph of commits, and it's terrifying, right? <laughs> because a commit is how many times somebody has added something to Ceph, and it's, it's ramping up. So we end up with Ceph, which is this. It might be a little difficult to see because uh, our, our, our marketing diagrams are not high contrast. Um, I have a technical diagram later you can see from the back of the room. But uh, this is essentially what Ceph is. It's a storage cluster underneath. Uh, it's an object store. And on top of the object store, there's a Ceph object gateway, the Ceph block device, and the Ceph file system. If you want to speak to the Ceph storage cluster using objects, you speak through the object gateway. If you want to speak using virtual disks, you speak through the block device. And if you want files and directories, you go through the file system. But all of it is stored in the same storage cluster, and there are three interfaces. So this is the big picture view of Ceph. So the, the, the technical overview looks a little more like this, and you can read it from the back of the room. Uh, I made both of these graphs. One of them adheres to our design system and one of them does not. Can you guess which one does not adhere? Um, this is kind of what all the pieces look like. And these are the technical names for all the same things on the last slide. I'm going to go through each of these. And I'm going to start with Rados. So Rados is the Reliable Autonomic Distributed Object Store. And it's what's underneath everything inside of Ceph. And this is kind of how it works. If I have five disks, uh, and these could be spinners, they could be solid state, they could even be RAID groups if you wanted, but I have five disks, and I'm going to put five file systems on top of those five disks. And today, ButterFS, SFX, XFS, and X4 are the file systems that Ceph supports. On top of those file systems, you put OSDs, which is the object storage daemon. This is a software layer, and what it does is it takes each of those disks and makes it part of the Ceph storage cluster. So, it's a simple piece of software. When you configure it, you point it at a path, and it turns that path into a storage uh, location for, the, for, the, for the, the storage cluster. And then, of course, uh, when you interact with the storage cluster, you're interacting with uh, the entire cluster as a logical unit, not as an individual series of hosts, right? You, you talk to the cluster as, as, as one thing. <clears throat> so. You'll notice that in the, the image before, there were two types of uh, cluster members. There's the blue thing with the red bar, and then there's the M. And the blue thing with the red bar is the OSD, which uh, we mentioned before, which is the object storage daemon. This is the software that is responsible for providing access to the data. So generally, you'll have 10, 10 of these in a cluster to 10,000 of these in a cluster, tens to 10,000s, right? Uh, you kind of want one per disk. But really, it's, it's a particular point. You really want one per path, right? So if you have a RAID group underneath it or whatever, you want one generally per disk. This is responsible for, stir, for serving stored objects to clients. So if a client access, uh, requests an object, the OSD is what's going to actually pass that object back to the client. And it's also responsible for peering with other OSDs for replication and recovery tasks. So when nodes go down, when nodes come up, the OSDs work in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion to rebalance the data and recover. So that's what the OSDs do. The monitors <clears throat> are the second uh, type of required cluster member. The monitors, their only job is to maintain the cluster membership in state. They know who's in, who's out, who's up, and who's down at any given point in time. And generally, you want an odd number of these, and you want a small number of these, because they vote. They vote on whether a host is in or out or up or down using Paxos. So if you have you know, um, 100 of them, that's a really uh, unnecessary amount of people who have to agree on something. So you want a small number and generally an odd number of monitors. 
And another important distinction is that monitors don't serve stored data to clients. They're not part of the data path. They're just there to make sure that they understand the state of the cluster. So that's Rados underneath. And everything else in Ceph was built on top of Rados. So Rados is, is a, a really flexible, usable object store that we kind of use as an application platform for building all of this useful stuff. And the first useful thing is LibRados, which, as the name suggests, is a library for accessing Rados. So the way this works is, let's say I have an application and it wants to talk to my storage cluster. I link that application with LibRados, and that gives my application the intelligence to speak to the storage cluster. It's that simple, right? And of course, it's not a, a web services or REST based or anything like that. It's, it's, a, it's a native protocol, right? It's, it's, it's a socket, right? So it's really, really fast. So LibRados provides direct access to Rados for applications. And if you want some of the functionality of Rados, like um, access to its internal dictionaries or access to object classes or some of the more advanced stuff, you need to use LibRados. That's how you get to that stuff. So. The next thing <clears throat> built on top of Librados was Rados GW, the Rados Gateway. The Rados Gateway sits in between uh, your application and Rados, similarly to Librados. And what happens is, if your application contacts Librados, uh, Librados will s essentially act as an intermediary. And the trick is, it speaks that socket protocol out of the southbound side, but out of the northbound side, it speaks REST. And uh, when I say REST, that's really generic, but particularly it means that it speaks S3 and it speaks Swift today. So this Rados gateway is <clears throat> an object storage proxy. It's a really thin layer, and all it does is, is it, uh, it, it translates REST to, to, uh, to a direct Rados call. It also does support buckets in accounting that you'll need to uh, use it as uh, a replacement for Swift or S3. Um, and uh, it integrates with Keystone uh, and that sort of thing. And also, um, uh, it, it, it supports accounting for billing and that sort of stuff. So that's the Rados gateway. <clears throat> the next thing is RBD, which is probably the most interesting for people who are standing up cloud stacks. This is the Rados block device. This is our, our block storage interface. So the way that this works is if I have little bits of a, a, of a volume spread throughout my cluster in four megabyte chunks, uh, RBD will uh, link into the virtualization container, Zen, or, at, well, not, not Zen yet, but uh, QMU KVM today. Zen's coming up soon. And pre present that as a disk to a virtual machine, right? Or I'll say it the other way. If I have a, a volume that I want to store inside Rados, what RBD does is it takes that volume, it stripes it up into a whole bunch of different chunks, and uh, distributes it throughout the cluster. Now, when I want to use it, uh, you can either link with libRBD uh, from within a virtualization container or something else like Samba. We have Samba and Ganesha plugins that are in the works as well. Uh, and that kind of allows you to access those volumes. And it, you can do something really interesting as well. Since you're not storing the image on the same physical hard drive where your hypervisor lives, like it, since, since you no longer have your compute and your storage on the same physical node because you're distributing your storage, you can do really interesting things like take a virtual machine and move it from one container to another. You can suspend it on this hypervisor and bring it up on this other hypervisor, and you don't have to copy the image across, right? And if your hypervisor supports it, uh, RBD actually supports live migration. You need support in your hypervisor, though. Another way to get access to RBD uh, volumes is to use the kernel module. So it's been mainline Linux kernel for a while now, and um, you can essentially map uh, an RBD volume to a Linux device. So you, you know, RBD map, and then it basically gives you a, a device in slash dev that you can make FS on, and you can mount and treat just like a normal disk. But it's actually distributed throughout the cluster, and you get parallelism on your reads, and you get uh, the redundancy of knowing that you have replicas underneath, and, and it's, it's a very robust way to store disks. So the Rados block device is storage of disk images inside Rados. It uh, decouples the VM from the host, which is a really powerful thing because it gives you the ability to distribute load amongst hyper, uh, different hypervisors. Um, and generally, images are striped across the entire cluster, although really they're striped across the pool that you're choosing because there there's this concept of pools and stuff. Uh, you can do really interesting stuff like snapshots of these uh, disk images. You can do copy on write clones, which I'll get more into a little bit later. It's had mainline Linux kernel support since 2.639, and it also has support in uh, QMU KVM, and we have native Zen support coming up soon. And this has also been integrated into all the cloud stacks that we can think of. Uh, cloud stack, most notably, uh, works pretty well with the Rados block device for uh, storage of uh, volumes. 
So the final thing that's part of the Ceph system is CephFS. And CephFS is a distributed file system. So you'll notice there's a, a new type of cluster member here, which is a metadata server. And the way that it works is when you mount the file system that's stored in Ceph, you first have to talk to the metadata server for all the POSIX semantics, right? That's going to store, you know, permissions. It's going to store last mod, all, all the posix -y, you know, stuff that you need to know, what, what directory it's in and what other stuff's in that directory and all of that stuff, you know, recursive accounting and all of that. So there's a separate round trip you go to the metadata server to handle all this metadata. Then you get your data directly from the OSD. So the metadata server is not part of the data path either, any more than the monitor is. Uh, all the data is always going to come from the OSDs. But the metadata server allows the management of this metadata for all the POSIX semantics to happen in a separate unit, right, that can also scale out the way that we need to scale out. So the job of this is to manage all that metadata, including directory hierarchy, file metadata. Uh, it actually stores that metadata inside Rados because uh, it wouldn't make sense to have it sitting in, you know, some local hard drive of some metadata server. So it stores the data inside Rados, which means that if you lose a metadata server, you can bring another one up and recover the state. Um, and it's only required if you're using the shared file system. So if you're not using the shared file system, you don't need to have any metadata servers at all. So actually, I can pause for a second for clarifications on this before I go into my next section about kind of what makes Ceph a little different from the other stuff that you might hear about. Any, any questions before I move on? Yes. So, did I any correctly? Oh, one second. There's a microphone on the way. Did I, did I understand correctly that Ceph supports block level storage like iSCSI does? Yes. Okay. As a matter of fact, there's an iSCSI uh, target framework that I think we just, we just did some patches to. So there's actually iSCSI support. But RBD, yes, it, it is block, block support. Uh, sorry, block device support. Although, um, it's, it's generally user space at the moment, right? So you, there's a libRBD that you link with that gives you access to those volumes, or there's the kernel module that'll give you access to those volumes. The iSCSI stuff is kind of a community initiative at the moment, but it's on its way. Okay, I'll continue. So I'd like to talk about what makes Ceph a little bit unique, uh, some of the things that, um, that make it different from whatever else is out there. And the first is how it places its data. Right? And, and therefore how it finds its data later. So if you have a whole bunch of computers and a whole bunch of disks and you want to write an object or read an object from this cluster, you have to know where to connect, right? Uh, a lot of people will solve this by having a controller that you connect to that then sends you to the right host on the back end, but that's an extra step and it doesn't scale. And so you need to know which OSD to connect to for your data. So I have a metaphor for this and I call it, how long did it take you to find your keys this morning? So every time I get home, I'm supposed to take my keys out of my pocket and put them on a little dish on my counter, and that way I know where they are, and they're always in the same place. And I never do it because I suck, but, and I'm always looking for my, where are my keys, where are they? So this is the metaphor. How long did it take you to find your keys this morning? So there's two ways to do data placement. The first is you talk to a centralized metadata server somewhere, and you say, okay, I'm looking for this object. Where is it? And it goes, oh, that one, that's on the fourth box from the top. Connect over there and go get it out of this pool, right? So somebody keeps track of where every object is, right? And this is what I call Dear Diary, today I put my keys on the kitchen counter. Imagine you have your phone and you go, oh, where did I put my keys today? Let me write that down, right? That's essentially what a lot of storage systems do. The other way is you look at your cluster and you sort of split it up, you know, and you say, I'm going to put these objects here and these objects here and these objects here, and you split up the namespace, essentially, and you break it up, kind of like you would break up the World Book Encyclopedia on a shelf, right? You say A, B, C, you know, Q's tiny, Z's tiny, M's like huge and all torn up. And then when you, when you need to know, okay, I have an object that starts with F, for example, it's going to be on that box because you know where it is, right? And this is what I call... I always put my keys on the hook by the door. And this is the system that I use for my keys at home, but it doesn't really work when your house is infinitely big and always changing, as a storage cluster is, right? Um, so, I mean, imagine if every time you came in your house it was infinitely large and different, where would you put your keys? You'd probably keep them in your pocket. Uh, I would. I wouldn't put them down anywhere. The way that Ceph does this is, is totally different. We call it CRUSH, right? And we, we're really fond of our acronyms. Uh, CRUSH is Controlled Replication Under Scalable Hashing. And it's an algorithm, essentially. So this is basically how it works. If I have a bunch of bits that I want to store in the cluster, the very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to hash the object name, split it into a bunch of different placement groups. So I'm going to figure out which placement group this object belongs in. Right? So just split them up into a bunch of high-level groups based on their name. 
Then I'm going to call the crush algorithm on each of these placement groups. I'm going to pass it a cluster state and a rule set. And based on that, the algorithm is going to calculate where the data lives in the cluster. Right? So the calculation happens on the client. You don't need to talk to anybody to figure out where the data is. You don't need to ask anybody. You can calculate it based on the cluster state that you obtain from the, mon the monitor and the crush rules that you obtain from the monitor. And then it will take all of that and give you a statistically distributed uh, uh, sort of a statistically even distribution of your data, right? So crush is an algorithm. It's an algorithm that Ceph uses to place data in the cluster. It's pseudorandom, which means that it looks random and really isn't. <laughs> but it's a fast calculation. There's no lookup. It happens really quick. Like, there's no overhead in the calculation. It's repeatable. So if you give it the same inputs, it's always going to give you the same result. And it's deterministic, which means that, I don't know, it determines something. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> It means it's super, super pseudo-random. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, it, it provides a statistically uniform distribution, right? So it's not going to always, every, every storage node's not going to always have the same amount of stuff on it, exactly, but it's statistically uniform, right? And it's stable, which means that when something in the input to the algorithm changes, the output of the algorithm changes as little as possible, right? Which means that when something happens in your cluster, the recovery has to move stuff as little as possible. So for example, a client wants to connect to the server that contains that object. It will call crush, and crush will say, OK, it's there and there. And actually, it should be pointing to both of the green ones, but you know who's paying attention? Um, it'll tell you, OK, here's where your data is. It's on this host. You're not connecting to any centralized host or anything like that. D diving a little bit deeper, this is, this is how it really works. Let's say I have an object. It's got a name of foo and a pool of bar, right? The first thing that's going to happen is I'm going to hash foo into the number of placement groups, and I'm going to figure out that foo, based on its name, belongs in placement group 23. Then I'm going to look at the pool bar and figure out that bar is equal to 3. That's the, 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 the bar pool. So foo.bar ends up being 3.23. Then you pass 3.23 into the crush algorithm, and it tells you your target OSDs. And this is all a calculation that happens on the client. So let's say I have this cluster, and I lose a node. Right? So I have 10 nodes, and I've lost one. So what happens? What happens is the OSDs are constantly paying attention and working in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion. So they'll notice that this OSD is down. They'll get a new cluster map from the monitors who have voted and agreed that that cluster is actually, or that node is actually down and not just momentarily, well, it's, it's out and not down, I guess. Up and down is temporary, in and out is permanent. Uh, and it'll decide, OK, this node is out then each of these OSDs will go, OK, wait a second, I have red. And based on the new calculation with the new cluster map, red belongs there. So the nodes will move from node to node, peer to peer, and do their rebalancing. Now, if I have 100 nodes and I lose one node, crush is going to move 1 100th one of the data. So it's 1 over n of the data gets moved, which is a pretty small amount of data to actually move, especially when you're considering that it's happening from many to many, many hosts to many hosts. So recovery can be, can be very effective with, with Ceph. Then, of course, the client, having received the new uh, cluster map, is going to call the crush algorithm to calculate the location of the data, and it's going to end up telling it to go where the data is now. So it's this really strange thing where you have this magic algorithm that clients use to figure out where the data is, and you have the algorithm that the server is also using to move the data to where it should be. So it's like you're shooting basketball and you're really terrible, but no matter where you throw the ball, the hoop moves, and the ball goes through the hoop. That's kind of how it works. So the second thing that makes Ceph really unique is the way that it deals with layering and cloning on its block devices. So remember this image from before where we have our sort of uh, blocks spread across the cluster and then uh, libRBD is assembling them into a disk for a virtual machine, but it never looks like this. It always looks more like that, right? You have hundreds and hundreds and dozens and dozens and dozens of these VMs. And so the question that occurs to anybody who runs a ton of VMs is how do you spin these VMs up instantly and efficiently, right? And uh, cost effectively. And our answer, uh, or one of our answers, is what we call um, the, the, the RBD layering, right? So the idea here is if I have this block uh, volume and it's 144 units of storage, I'm not saying those are blocks or K or bytes or whatever, it's 144 units of storage. With RBD, you can instantly copy that entire disk image as many times as you need and it will take up no additional space uh, until you start writing to them. 
So we now have five copies of this disk, taking up the original space, uh, taking up the space of the original copy. Then when clients begin to write data, they're going to write it to the copy. And when they want to read data, they're going to read it from the copy unless it doesn't have it, and then they'll read through to the master. Right? So this is, it's kind of a basic sort of um, basic layered, layered block device. And it's super powerful because I can spin up 1,000 VMs based on my standard OS image, and they won't take up additional space until you start writing to the copies. Now, what it doesn't do is keep track of how these copies are diverging and go through and clean up and say, oh, they diverged, but now it's the same and reduce. And so it's, it's, it's a one-time fork of the disk image. It's important to understand. <laughs> wow. So the third thing that uh, I think is worth mentioning that makes Ceph really different from a lot of the stuff that's out there is how it deals with metadata on the distributed file system part of Ceph. So this is, this is metadata. I mean, we look at metadata all the time. Anybody who works in Linux spends half their day looking at metadata from a file system. And there's tons of it. And uh, it's a giant diary and keeping track of where everything is and who owns it is tough. And you'll recall in here, we have the new cluster member of the metadata server, but there's something strange on this image. And that something strange is that you have three of these, right? So these metadata servers scale out. Just like everything else in this architecture, the metadata servers scale out as well. So how do you have a single tree uh, and a single author authoritative tree with multiple metadata servers, right? What we have built is called dynamic subtree partitioning. What it means is that when you have only one metadata server, that metadata server is responsible for the entire tree. When the second metadata server comes online, the metadata servers will determine what roughly half of the load is, and they will give that load to the second metadata server, right? And this, this happens pretty quickly because the data itself is stored inside Rados. So it doesn't have to transfer state or do any of that stuff. It's, it can be a relatively uh, instant uh, uh, handoff. Then when your third metadata server comes online, it'll take what roughly breaks up into thirds and then fourths, and then you can even go all the way down and have a metadata server that just handles a single file if you have a hot spot. If everybody's trying to access one file at the same time, you have a metadata server that just handles uh, requests for metadata on that file. Right? And it all happens dynamically, which is why we call it dynamic subject partitioning. So this changes all the time. Constantly, metadata servers will be handing off control of different parts of the subtree to other metadata servers. And that's how we believe we're able to get around the, the scalable metadata problem inside Ceph. So I'm going to sort of um, wrap with some, some resources uh, about Ceph. I'm really, I'm a big fan of easy to remember URLs. So if you want to download Ceph, ceph.com slash get, get. Ceph.com slash get, that's what you need if you want to get the latest stuff. Uh, if you want to deploy a test cluster, the best way to do that is to follow our quick start guide, which is ceph.com slash QSG for quick start guide. You can also, there's a link to that from ceph.com slash get, get, easy to remember, get. Uh, <laughs> so the quick start guide is there, and it's, it's kind of a five minute guide you can use to, if, if you already have Ubuntu set up, or you know, I think it's, yeah, Ubuntu, if you have Ubuntu set up, you can get a Ceph cluster running pretty quickly. The third thing is getting Ceph deployed on the AWS free tier using Juju. There's a really helpful blog post that uh, one of our community managers, Patrick, put up that's you know, a 10 minute guide to standing up a Ceph cluster in the AWS free tier using uh, Ubuntu's Juju deployment tool. And it's pretty cool. Then there's ceph.com slash docs for all the rest of the docs. There's a member of our team named John Wilkins. If you ever see him, give him a hug. He spends his life looking at header files and documenting options. And <clears throat> it's a very special kind of work, and we are all very happy that he does it. And his docs are at ceph.com slash docs. So because we're an open source project, um, it's, not, it's not just ours, it's all of ours, right? So we want everybody to be in, involved. So, we have a, a mailing list, as most open source projects do, ceph.com slash list, and it's a good place to go to ask questions. Uh, there's a users list, which is for any kind of question. There's a devel list, which is for more um, sort of engineering type conversations. There's an IRC channel, ceph.com slash IRC. And uh, we actually have, uh, if, you, if you need help, ceph.com slash, um, I think help. <laughs> yeah, ceph.com slash help. You can actually, we, we have, shifts on IRC where you know that a Ceph engineer is going to be there. So if you go there, you can see the schedule. If you have trouble getting Ceph up and running, you can show up in IRC during one of, the, one of the times, and somebody from Ink Tank or somebody from another company that's part of the Ceph ecosystem will help you. Uh, and so it's really good to know. And then, of course, there's a bug tracker. That's where bugs get filed. And um, if you want to start writing docs, 
then uh, you can contribute to docs, and that's definitely something that we need. So one final thing before I go. We just released Ceph Cuttlefish, which uh, is, um, we, we name all of our releases after cephalopods because that's how we did it. So there was Argonaut, Bobtail, Cuttlefish. The next one is Dumpling. And we're trying to figure out E. And we think we might go with Emperor. And then Fire, F's definitely going to be Firefly. Um, but Cuttlefish is the best Ceph ever, as every one of our releases is the best one ever, as typically happens. Um, what's new in this release is the new Ceph Deploy provisioning tool. So uh, this is a... Uh, sort of Python-based, uh, script-based, easily scriptable, easily, uh, easily automated provisioning tool for, for getting Ceph up and running. Uh, there's new Chef cookbooks as well for deploying Ceph. Uh, we have fully tested packages for, uh, for uh, RHEL uh, via Apple now in Cuttlefish. There's also an API for RGW, uh, the Rails Gateway Authentication Management, which was something we needed to build for our uh, um, Keystone integration for OpenStack, but it's, it's available for everybody. We have some pool quotas. We have an interesting Ceph DF command, which is sometimes it's difficult when you have 10,000 nodes to figure out how much space you have remaining. So it's nice to have that kind of command. And we now have incremental snapshots on RBD. So you can not just take a snapshot of a block device, but you can take a, a snapshot and then another snapshot and then just get the difference and actually apply it to another image somewhere else if you want. So that's Ceph Cuttlefish. And um, again, you can get it at ceph.com slash get. So that's, there's my contact information again, uh, and I'm available for questions if you have any. Okay. So any compression is supported? Do you support compression? I'm sorry, I, I couldn't hear. Compression, I mean, uh, LZ deflate for storing the data. Uh, oh, compression, 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 compression. Um, not at this time. Yeah, it could, be, it could be covered by the underlying file system, right? Just like I think um, there's some encryption things that be covered by the underlying file system. Uh, so if you run a Ceph object storage daemon on top of a file system that has compression, then, uh, then it will work. Uh, but there's nothing in the OSDs that does compression at this point. And how is it integrated with OpenStack? Um, did you mean cloud stack? No, I'm just kidding. Mm -hmm. um, it, <laughs> it integrates with OpenStack. Uh, Let's see. I had a slide about that I actually took out. Um, so on the object storage side, it speaks to Swift API, and it integrates with Keystone. So uh, you've got the sort of authentication handled on that side, and you have API compatibility. On the uh, block storage side, it integrates with Glance for uh, image, storage. Uh, image storage. You can actually take a volume and, and make it a copy of, a, of an image, right? So you can take your Ubuntu image and then you know, make a volume that's uh, a layer of that. Uh, and it also integrates with um, the uh, with Nova via the hypervisor. Or no, sorry, uh, Glance. What's the other one? <laughs> Cinder. Thank you, Cinder. Yeah, it, it, we we are integrated with Cinder as well, right? Cinder is a is a block device abstraction layer essentially that you plug into a bunch of underlying uh, block storage uh, systems, and Ceph is one of those. And then, of course, through the hypervisor, we integrate with Nova. Thanks, Sam. Yes. Um, going into a little bit more detail on those questions. Uh, in Cinder, do you support shared volumes across multiple Nova compute nodes or Nova guest instances? Shared volumes, shared. meaning the same virtual machine running off of the same uh, volume? The same volume being shared among multiple Nova compute um, uh, uh, between multiple guest instances on Nova. So with RBD, we generally suggest that you mount it from one place. Yeah, it's doable, but with, 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 a, with a block device, um, I, I wouldn't want to mount it and run virtual machine, two virtual machines off of the same image. I wouldn't uh, want to do uh, that. That's, that's fine. A couple more questions. Mm -hmm. Do you support snapshots with the Cinder driver? Uh, the snapshots are supported in Ceph. I don't know if we wired them up through Cinder yet, but you can always do the snapshots on Ceph via the command line. And last question, on the rel uh, client support, is that the fuse, the file system in user space, or do you have it in the kernel yet? So I believe on rel, it's the server side components that we have in Apple. Uh, I don't think the kernel in rel is new enough to support our, uh, uh, our modules yet. Um, but RBD can be done through user space as well. Uh, and um, I believe the fuse stuff 
I believe the few still work, but I don't think the kernel modules are there. I don't think the kernel version is new enough. So I was wondering about metadata servers. Um, is it possible to have a split brain condition? <laughs> Can you possibly have a split brain condition with uh, multiple metadata servers? Yeah, you, you can have a split-brain condition with multiple metadata servers, which is why we suggest having an odd number of them. Because you end up with two of them on one side and one on the other, and the side that has two is going to be the canonical side, right? So the metadata servers as well decide, the, decide upon whether or not one is really down or, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the, I, I believe so. Um, <clears throat> oh, oh, you weren't talking about monitors, you are talking about MDS. No, so split-brain with yeah. MDS, oh. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> That's a good question for Sage. I'm going to have to ask him that. Um, I would... Because, I mean, it sounds like they shouldn't because if each one has control of only a part of a tree, then that's all they need to be aware of. And yeah. if that one goes down, then it's kind of unequiv unequiv unequivocal that that part of the tree is no longer under control of anybody until someone else assumes it. But something, somebody owns the root of that tree, right? Right. So that's if there's a split brain, it's kind of like, does, this brain, does the side that have the, what controls the root, is that going to be the one that is right. true? That, that's that's a I'm good wondering. question. That's a great yeah. question. I, I should ask Sage that when I, when I get back. Um, happy to follow up if you, if you want. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Cool. Ross, I was able to find videos of you giving this presentation online. Is the presentation itself going to be on SlideShare? Yeah, uh, I've given it to uh, I've given it to them, and they'll, they'll have it on cloud? SlideShare. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And yeah, there, there's videos. The, this the, the intro to Ceph Talk is is um, it's one we give a lot because it's information a lot of people need. So you can find this talk in a couple of different formats online if you need it. But these exact slides with all the latest cuttlefish stuff and all of that are going to be up. All right, thank you so much.